I am a 20 year old female, but the story took place when I was 11. I was with my younger cousin, who was also a female, and was around 8 years old at this time. We will call her Julie. Our small town was located on the outskirts of Rockford, Illinois. It has a notorious reputation for drugs, violent crime, and sex trafficking. I lived in a neighborhood with a Casey's gas station within walking distance. I would often go there with my friends to buy energy drinks, snacks, and junk food. I could go there pretty much whenever I wanted to, since nobody had to drive me there. My parents didn't keep too close of an eye on me, and I was a fairly self-sufficient kid for my age, which was definitely to my advantage in this experience. One night, Julie and I decided to have a sleepover at my house. I told my parents we were going to walk to the gas station to grab some drinks with my leftover birthday money. They were talking and drinking with my aunt and uncle, and just sort of shooed us away. It took us maybe 10 to 15 minutes to walk there. As we were entering the parking lot, we saw a big semi-truck parked in front of the building. This wasn't that unusual, especially if supply is being dropped off. As we were walking past it, a middle-aged man came out of the gas station and asked us how we were doing. We were polite kids, so we stayed and talked with him for a couple of minutes. Do you girls like horses? We both replied, yes. There are a couple of thoroughbreds in the trailer if you want to look at them real quick. Julie got really excited and instantly agreed and begins to make her way to the other side of the truck. I hesitated, feeling that something was really off about this situation for two reasons. One, there wasn't a diesel pump at this gas station, and this man didn't seem to be dropping off any supplies at the store. There was another gas station that did have diesel pumps less than a mile down the road. Two, the trailer wasn't the right kind for him to have horses in it. Horse trailers have large windows so that the horses can breathe and whatnot. If you were to put a horse inside the trailer that he was hauling, it would have suffocated. This was the biggest red flag for me. There was no way he actually had horses in his trailer. He took a step closer to us, and I began to panic before blurting out, My dad is actually going to be here any minute, so we're in a bit of a hurry. Julie protested, knowing that this was a lie. I had to cover up by saying that he had texted me while we were walking. Oh, are you girls sure you don't want to see them? It would only take a second. He said, as he inched closer to us. I apologized to him, grabbed Julie by the arm, and pulled her into the gas station. I didn't stop there, though. I dragged her all the way to the women's bathroom. All the while, she was complaining about not getting to see the horses. I had to tell her why I lied, and when she understood, she went quiet. After five minutes, I told her to wait there, and the Abba go see if the man was gone. As I peered through the window into the parking lot, I saw that the coast was clear. So we bought what we came for, and left with a bag in each of our arms. It was dark by this point, and to avoid any other interactions with strange people with dangerous propositions, we trespassed through a field instead of walking along the main road. We both figured that would be the better route from now on. We never told our parents about this encounter, because we didn't want them to say that we could no longer go by ourselves anymore. I know that sounds like a dumb reason, but I figured if I could sniff out one potential kidnapping, I could do the same if it were to ever happen again. I was a strange kid, and I really loved books, movies, and shows related to kidnapping. The point is, I felt like I could handle this kind of situation if it came my way again. Now that I'm older, I know that mindset was incredibly stupid, since I'm now aware of the gamble I was taking. I'm lucky that was the only time that I had ever felt unsafe there. This story takes place during Thanksgiving break. 
when I was just starting middle school. My old elementary school had a termite problem, and the school board decided to move operations to the local YMCA. They were told that the infestation was more severe than they thought, and it would take about a year and a half to deal with it. When the school was being renovated, my brother Jack and I decided to go check things out. The school never really had any rumors about being haunted or anything, so we weren't really expecting anything to happen. We walked around looking at all the demolished walls and piles of old wood and glass. We weren't the only ones who had this bright idea, because we saw very inappropriate content either drawn or written on some of the classroom chalkboards. Jack and I just about had our fill of this place, and decided to go check out one more classroom before leaving. The chalkboard in that room had a message written on it. Look under the sink. So my brother, being the stupid person that he is, goes over to the sink and opens up the cabinet beneath it. There's nothing there. But as soon as he stood up, we heard a loud crash. We both looked to the far end of the classroom. There was a man in a white phantom mask. I recognized it from the plays my school did of Phantom of the Opera. The man proceeded to walk along the row of classroom windows and shattered each of them with a crowbar. Jack and I rushed out of the room and down the long hallway towards the exit. While we were running, I remembered hearing footsteps behind us. I also remember hearing someone yelling, but that could have been my mind just playing tricks on me due to the state of heightened panic I was in. When we got back to our house, we didn't say a word about this to anyone. We didn't want to get in trouble for being at the school after hours. When the school finally became operational again, we didn't hear anything about shattered windows or a masked man with a crowbar. Seeing how we clearly weren't the only ones who decided to trespass, I imagine there was a few instances of vandalism that the construction crew had to deal with. I know that kids, especially at that age, can have wild imaginations, but encountering real danger is something you'll never forget. I don't know if the Phantom was trying to scare us or wanted to bash our heads in, but my brother and I weren't sticking around to find out. I was 23 years old when this happened and was living in the city of brotherly love at the time, Philadelphia. The girl I was dating lived about 35 to 40 minutes outside of the city near West Chester. After hanging out for a while, I left her place around 12.30 a.m. I really shouldn't have stayed out that late because I had an early shift that morning. As soon as I left her neighborhood, I noticed that my gas light was on. I put in directions to the nearest gas station on my GPS and drove five minutes to the local Wawa. I was familiar with this area it was very low on crime, unlike many other places outside of Philly. So stopping here this late at night wasn't something that I was nervous about. There were two other cars parked there when I pulled in. I filled my tank and I realized that two of my tires were low on air. So I drove to the corner of the parking lot where they had the air pumps. I started working on my first tire. When I looked up and saw an older pickup truck pulling into the parking lot, I didn't think twice about it, until it drove up right next to my car. The truck began backing into the area where another air pump was. Any other day, I would have just assumed that it was somebody else trying to get air into their tires. But something gave me a bad feeling. The driver exited the truck. He looked to be in his late 50s, early 60s, and had scruffy facial hair and glasses. He looked like the stereotypical creep. He just stood by his driver's side door and stared at me. This was when I began to feel uneasy. Uh, is your pump out of order, sir? I asked, trying to break the tension. The man did not respond, 
he just kept giving me that cold stare. He finally moved away from the door and reached into the bed of his truck, his eyes never leaving me. He then produced a rope and began sprinting toward me. I immediately threw down the air nozzle and jumped into my car, which was already running. I threw it into drive, when suddenly, a hand slammed directly on my driver's side window and dragged sideways as I peeled out of there, leaving a smear. As I was driving home, my heart was pounding out of my chest for the first 10 minutes. I've never had anything like this happen to me. Two weeks later, a girl I was friends with on Instagram posted an article about multiple kidnappings in the Westchester area. I immediately thought back to that man in the truck. I'm thankful that I was able to escape. I almost became a statistic. The year was 1991. I was in third grade, and my older sister was in fifth. We attended an elementary school that was just a few blocks away from our childhood home, and we lived one street over from my grandparents. Our neighborhood had a lot of children, and there were usually adults outside working in the garden or fixing cars. One day after we were dropped off, we decided to go visit our grandfather, who worked nights as an airplane mechanic for the Air Force. My grandparents' house had a huge privacy fence. We would drop in from time to time, but if the gate was locked, we would just turn around and go home. As we were about to cross the street, we saw a man blocking our path, staring us down. The man looked like he benched semi-trucks in his spare time. Aside from us and the brute, the streets were completely deserted. If we cried out for help, I don't think there was anyone outside that would hear us. <laughs> Just our luck. The one day our street is empty, we encounter a steroid-addicted lunatic. The man began charging toward us. You two are coming with me. That was our cue to start running. Due to a recent surgery that I had on my ankle, I was having trouble keeping up. So my sister put me on her shoulders and bolted down an alley that led back to our house. We raced to the front door and began beating on it. But nobody was home. We looked behind us as the man emerged from the alley. Just then, our next door neighbor, who was an older woman, came outside to see what the commotion was. She was holding a shotgun in her hands. She saw how frightened we were and then looked at the imposing man coming toward us. She instantly put two and two together. She raised her gun. You leave these kids alone or say goodbye to your manhood. The man stopped in his tracks, raised his hands in the air, then slowly backed away, eventually disappearing down the alley. My sister called the cops, and then our dad. The police never found out who that man was, although there were some other abductions of children around our area, which were suspected to be linked to human trafficking. I am very thankful that our neighbor intervened with her BFG that day. Otherwise, my sister and I could have been abducted. I am a female, and I am originally from Denmark, but I moved to America in 2009. I've studied English since I was in third grade, because I've always wanted to visit America. When I was a kid... I just wanted to go there and have fun. But as I got older, my reasons for going there changed. I love my home country, but the truth is that there are limited opportunities there. When I was 19, I decided that I needed to get out of there. I wanted a better life for myself, and I was tired of being broke and cold. I was eventually accepted into a college in San Francisco but finding a place to stay was difficult. Everywhere I looked was out of my price range. By chance, a friend of mine put me in contact with a family member of his who happened to live in Oakland, which is the city directly east of San Francisco. 
I'll call this man George. George was also from Denmark like me, but he moved away and started a family in California. Since our stories were similar, he agreed to take me in until I found another arrangement. My room was on the ground level and overlooked the backyard. At first, things were great. I know that Oakland has a reputation for being a rough place, but the area that we were in was very nice. I wasn't really into American football before I came here, but George was a die-hard Raiders fan. He explained to me that in order to assimilate into American culture, I had to pick a football team to root for, and he said to me that if I rooted for any other team aside from the Raiders, that I would have to find another place to stay. George's wife wanted to take a trip down to Houston to visit her parents. George agreed under the condition that they would go see the Raiders play against the Texans while they were down there. So they would be gone for about a week. This was around early October. Two days after they left, I was up late studying for some upcoming exams. There was a nice breeze out that night, so I kept the window open. I must have dozed off at my desk, which has happened many times before, because when I woke up, I was still sitting in my computer chair. I was about to get up when I heard a sound that sent chills up my back. Someone was breathing right behind me. I quickly stood up, but before I could scream, I felt a hand covering my mouth, followed by a blade against my neck. You make a sound, and I'll bleed you dry, a shaky voice said. Words cannot describe how scared I was in that moment. There was a mirror in front of the desk, and I saw my own terrified face in its reflection. The person behind me had a black mask on, with a hood over his head. We're going to move over to the window. Blink once if you understand me. I blinked. Good. If you cooperate with me, you won't get hurt. Next to the window, there was a lamp that sat on top of a nightstand. It had a thick glass base, and the switch was broken. The only way to turn it on and off was to either plug it in or unplug it. And at the moment, it was off. This will be important to remember before we get into what happened next. As we move next to the window, the voice spoke again. I have a gun on me, so don't try anything. As soon as he said that, he lowered the blade off of my neck. I didn't know if he had a gun or if he was just bluffing. But regardless, he would need at least a couple of seconds to pull it out. I wasn't going to give him the chance. I quickly grabbed the lamp off the nightstand and smashed it over his head. I then jumped out of the window and raced toward the nearest neighbor's house. I heard an angry shout from behind me, but I didn't look back. I woke up the neighbor by pounding on his front door like a crazy person. Soon the police were called, and they showed up there about 10 minutes later. They searched George's house from top to bottom, but there were no signs of the intruder, and thankfully, nothing seemed to be missing. That kind of unnerved me because that meant he specifically came in to kidnap me and wasn't interested in anything else. I'm afraid that I'm going to have to end this story with the same old, they never found the guy. But there is a bit of hope, because they did find a big red blood stain by the window, along with pieces of the broken lamp, which were taken as evidence. So if he commits another crime, they have his DNA on file. Since it's been over a decade, I think I knocked some sense into him. I got the feeling that he was nervous about what he was doing, and me smashing the lamp over his head was a wake-up call for him. And by the way, if you're wondering, the Raiders got absolutely destroyed in Texas. 29-6 to six.
This happened late one night, when I was driving back home from work on a dark and lonely highway. It was the kind of night that makes you wish that you were at home relaxing instead of being out on the road. There were no other cars in sight, and by happenstance, I was driving through dark territory, meaning that there is no reception on my phone. I had been driving for quite some time and was starting to zone out a little bit. That's not to say that I was falling asleep behind the wheel. I was just sort of on autopilot. As I rounded a bend, I saw a semi-truck parked on the side of the road ahead of me. Not really anything out of the ordinary. Truckers will sometimes park off to the side to catch some shut-eye during their long trips across the country. But there was something about this truck that unnerved me. I got the feeling that whoever was behind the wheel wasn't resting. They were waiting. I slowed down as I approached the truck, and I tried to get a good look inside of the cab. But the windows were tinted, and it was very dark out, so it was like looking into a black void. I also noticed that both the truck and the trailer were completely black. After passing the truck, I sped up and returned to my original speed. I didn't want to go too fast in case a trooper was hiding out somewhere, tagging passing cars. As I continued down the road, I kept thinking back to that strange truck I saw. I couldn't shake off the feeling that I was in some kind of danger. Perhaps it was just my overactive imagination. Damn it, get a hold of yourself. It was just a truck recounting sheep on the side of the road. Saying it out loud did not make it any more convincing. There was something off about that truck. As I was about to turn down another corner, I heard the unmistakable sound of an engine revving up behind me. I looked in my rearview mirror as a pair of headlights came up fast behind me. I panicked and pressed down on my gas pedal but my car was nowhere near fast enough to outrun the truck. The headlights were now directly behind me, practically blinding me. My heart was pounding out of my chest. I knew that there was something up with that truck, but now I had to do everything I could to get away from it. But the road was narrow, with no side streets or exits in sight. I was trapped out here, with this massive 18-wheeler right behind me, Suddenly, a hidden trooper didn't sound too bad. As we continued down the road, the truck eventually slowed down and stayed a safe distance behind me, still not making any attempts to pass me. The truck then flicked off its headlights. Oh, hell no. I immediately sped up, looking into my rearview mirror. I could make out the vague silhouette of the truck getting further and further away as I floored it down the highway until it disappeared from view. When I finally arrived home safely, I parked my car in the driveway and went inside, making sure that all my doors and windows were locked. I was exhausted. Nothing takes it out of you like being afraid for your life out on a dark highway. I just wanted to get some sleep and put this entire thing behind me. About an hour later, I was woken up by the unmistakable sound of an idling engine coming from outside. Half asleep, I got up and looked out my window. I became fully awake once I saw what was parked outside, a black semi-truck parked in the road outside of my house. Not only was I terrified from my previous encounter, but what was equally jarring was that this massive truck was in a residential area. I have no idea how that driver maneuvered down the narrow streets. This was the first time I got a good look at the truck. It had no commercial markings on it whatsoever, so there was no chance of me calling a number to let the company know that one of their drivers is a psychopath with a bad case of road rage. Also, I never got a good look at the driver's tags but I imagine they would have read, beating you. I mentally could not handle seeing the truck outside of my house. I just remember saying, no. And crawling back into bed, I didn't have the energy to deal with this insane shit. I just remembered hearing the truck pulling away as I drifted off to sleep. 
To this day, I'm still not sure if the driver somehow found out where I lived or if it was just a very vivid nightmare. The next morning, I considered calling the police to report the strange encounter, but honestly, what were they going to do? There was no damage to my car, and there was no proof of what happened out there on the highway. Over the next few weeks, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being followed. I became severely paranoid, constantly looking over my shoulder and freaking out every time I saw a dark colored truck. One day I was walking back from the grocery store and I saw a black semi parked on the side of the road. After nearly having a panic attack, I was put at ease once I saw the commercial markings on the side of its trailer. I realized that it was just another semi truck with a black paint job. What happened to me that night was terrifying but the fear that it caused me was taking over my ability to be rational. After a while, I could not allow it to control me anymore, and I eventually had to move on with my life. It's been years, but I still think about that black semi-truck from time to time. Ultimately, this experience has taught me to trust my instincts and to be extremely cautious when driving alone on remote roads. I still wonder who was behind the wheel of that truck and what their intentions were. When I was 19, I got a job off of Craigslist as a repossession agent. That means if somebody isn't making their car payments, the loan provider will pay me to repossess the vehicle. It was mostly an honest living. However, it did involve sometimes trespassing onto private property and I technically wasn't old enough to get a repo license. But I was flat ass broke, and the men who owned the company needed someone who spoke both Spanish and English, and didn't stick out like a sore thumb in a minority neighborhood. In this line of work, you do have to consider things like this. From 10 p.m. to 10 a.m., Monday through Friday, I repossessed cars with a partner for cash commission. Throughout my time as a repo man, my partner and I found ourselves in several dangerous situations, but there is one in particular that comes to mind whenever someone asks me, what is the craziest thing that's ever happened when you were a repo man? It was around 1 a.m. in one of the worst neighborhoods in the area. Since it was a weeknight, there would typically be a fair bit of activity around this time. The local drug addicts loved to hang around and watch us take somebody else's car. Sometimes they would try talking to us, which was irritating, and sometimes they would try to make a scene to warn the person that we were taking their car, which was infuriating. However, this night was unusual. There was nobody around. There was no barking dogs, no screeching cats, no sounds of traffic or wind blowing through the street, not even crickets, just silence. The best way I can describe the atmosphere was intense. The glow of the streetlights were a good distance away from the condos we were sent to, which made the area especially dark. Even so, the car we wanted was nowhere to be found. We decided to park our company truck right in front of the condo. I walked to the front door while my partner went around back. I knocked. But there was no answer. I was ready to drop a contact card and get out of there until my partner reappeared and whispered, Hey, there's a light on inside. I followed him to the side of the building where through a gap in the blinds, I could see a light on in the apartment's main room. I looked a bit closer and saw that the space was completely empty aside from a jug of Sunny D sitting on the floor. I watched closely for any movement. After a few moments, a dog ran across the ground up to the window, and I was about to go back out front and knock on the door again. My partner took off in a panicked run toward the truck. Dude, we gotta go. Confused, I followed. He jumped in the driver's seat and started the engine as I grabbed the shotgun from the back seat. He threw it into gear and sped off in a hurry. My heart was racing. I was ready for a high-speed chase 
with the possibility of a shootout. I looked over to my partner. His face was pale white, and I could see beads of sweat coming down his forehead. He was driving fast, trying to catch his breath. Well, what the hell happened back there? He snapped a look at me, as if I had just asked him the dumbest question in the world. You didn't see that guy? No. What guy? In the window. No, man. All I saw was a dog. That wasn't a fucking dog. Now I was very confused. There was a guy running around on all fours, butt-ass naked, pretending to be a dog. You didn't see that? No, man. I was only at the window for a few seconds. I thought it was a dog. That was a guy. He ran up to the window on his hands and knees, spread the blinds and gave me the goat. The goat? He put his balls between his legs, and then he spread his ass cheeks right up against the window. Oh, Jesus. That's gnarly. You didn't see that at all? <laughs> nah, man. I would have remembered that. All I saw was a jug of Sunny D on the floor. And I thought there was a dog running around. No way. There was a crazy guy in there. I saw his bare ass and everything. I really thought it was just a dog. Perhaps there was a real dog in the condo, along with the person pretending to be one. It's either that or sleep deprivation was getting to me. I don't remember much after that. We finished up our shift and went home. I went on to repossess cars for about another year before I made a much needed change in careers. But nothing else sticks out in my mind about those days, like the terrified look on my partner's face when he told me what he saw. It wasn't the most action-packed repo night I've ever had, but it was definitely the strangest. When I was 19, I worked for a company that allocated labor to rural areas of Australia. Basically, you would tell them when you were available, and they would send you to a remote farm for a few weeks, and you would do whatever needed to be done. It was hard work and long hours, but good pay and good fun if you got with a nice group of co-workers. When this occurred, I was working on a large property. I was told it covered roughly the same land mass as the state of Maryland in the United States. It was located about nine hours from Sydney, and the property itself was about 40 minutes to the nearest town. In short, it was in the middle of nowhere. I was working clearing some bushland with three other guys who were around my age. Our boss was a guy called Jeremy, who owned the farm and supervised us while helping out with the work. He was pretty laid back and was generally very good to us. This summer in particular was very hot and the work was hard. So one day when the temperature hit about 38 degrees Celsius, that's about 100 Fahrenheit, Jeremy decided to give us the afternoon off. He said he knew of a water hole on the farm it was about a 25 minute drive going north. I was keen for a swim, but the other guys just wanted to relax. So Jeremy and I hopped in one of the work trucks and started heading across the property. It was mostly wide, empty expanses with a few clusters of bushland. Jeremy was not much of a talker, so we drove more or less in silence. After about 20 minutes, he suddenly perked up and jabbed my ribs. Hey, do you see that over there? Beneath the two dead trees? I should mention that if you're not familiar with the inland areas, especially those in Australia, they are brown or red and mostly flat and bland, meaning that any bright colors stick out like a sore thumb. So you can imagine our surprise when we saw a large blue angular structure far off in the distance. We steered in its direction, and as we got closer, we realized it was a huge blue shipping container, just sitting there in the middle of nowhere. Jeremy was perplexed. I asked him if he knew what it was, but he obviously didn't. He said he hadn't seen it when he drove out this way, five weeks before, and he wanted to go see what it was. Initially, I pulled to a stop about 100 meters away from it, at this stage, I had a really bad feeling. The whole thing wasn't right, 
It's hard to explain, but if you can imagine seeing such a foreign object in the middle of a huge barren expanse, it had to be something weird. Jeremy, however, wanted to investigate, which I understood. It was his property, but in truth, I was really anxious. As we got closer, things got even more bizarre. There was a big diesel generator behind it, thumping away, and it had a CCTV camera on each side, all motion activated, so they buzzed from side to side, following us as we moved around. I tried to reason with Jeremy, something along the lines of, With all this security, someone obviously doesn't want us being here. Well, let's just go. He had brushed me off, however, reminding me that it was his farm, and whoever put this here was trespassing. So he wanted to go inside. Despite all the surveillance, there was only a small padlock on a huge door. We had some bolt cutters in his toolbox, and after a bit of a struggle, we broke the lock and went inside. The first thing I noticed was the rush of cold air as we got in. The place was air-conditioned, which I must admit was quite pleasant on such a hot day. We searched around for a light switch, but I could already see this was some sort of IT setup. There were flashing LEDs all around, and the sort of hum you hear when a hard drive is processing. When we finally switched on the lights, we could see a sophisticated, albeit somewhat cluttered, office setup. There were hard drives the size of bar fridges and other computer equipment lining the walls, sometimes piled two or three high, and plastic storage boxes scattered all around the far wall and several desks with computer monitors arranged in the middle, complete with rolling office chairs. I felt like I was in one of those dreams that made no sense. None of this added up for me. We wandered to the middle and sat down at the desks to see if the computers could give us any idea of what the hell was going on here. My heart was racing and I just wanted a bolt. We had been seen by the CCTV cameras, so if anyone was monitoring, they already knew we were here. Jeremy, on the other hand, was adamant about getting to the bottom of this, so I put on brave face and started going through the computer. This went on for a while, but in short, neither of us had a very high grasp of technology outside of Facebook and Microsoft Word. It looked like old Napster or LimeWire download screens, just constantly picking up and receiving data, then recording it on several windows. I gave up on the computers, and I carefully walked over to the far end of the container, to the big pile of storage boxes. By then I was pretty sure that no one else was there. There was nowhere for them to hide. But I was still incredibly on edge. I decided against my better judgment to see what was inside all these boxes. My brief search through the box still makes me sick to my stomach. It didn't take long for me to realize that the box was full of posters, DVDs, and photos. All of hardcore CP. One thing that still gets me is that it was all neatly ordered into files and smaller boxes. These people were organized. I immediately recoiled, jumped up, and ran over to Jeremy. I could hardly string together a sentence. I had said something to the effect of, Mate, get out. Child sex. Go get the fuck up. I dragged him out, then composed myself and explained to him what I saw. We jumped back into the truck and sped back to the house. The farm had no mobile reception, and we hadn't brought a satellite phone, so we had to get back to the landline to call the police. Once we called them, they still had to make it all the way to the farm from the nearest police station, which was in a town about a half hour away. As I mentioned, very remote. We waited, talking frantically about what we had seen, until the cops got there almost an hour later. They arrived with two four-wheel drives, and we jumped in and led them back. This is where it gets worse. By the time we got back, the container door was open, and there was a fire inside. 
we had only two small extinguishers in the car. The fire department took an hour to get there, by which stage most of the damage was already done. An arson report by the federal police found almost no evidence of the computer equipment described, only traces of paper and cardboard. This means that whoever ran it knew we were there and had time to come remove most of it and get away. There were various ways to get off the property and the landmass was huge, so there was no real way to track them. Since the police hadn't taken us all too seriously in the first instance, probably due to the poor explanation on the phone, aerial surveillance was also impossible by the time we pieced everything together. I took a keen interest in following it up, but with no real evidence of who might be responsible, the investigation went cold. I've kept in contact with Jeremy, and the shipping container is still sitting there on the farm, as it's too expensive to move. I'll never forget what I saw in those boxes. Thank you for watching. If you have a story that you would like to share on this channel, please send it to my email, unit522stories at outlook.com. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button when notifications turned on. You can further support my channel by visiting the merch store. A link for that is in the description. You'll be hearing from me soon. Until next time, I'm your Uncle Unit. And as always, never forget. There's always a reason to be afraid. <laughs>